Hi, I'm Medicine Mary and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, please and hesitate click the subscribe button down below. And without further ado, let's get into my media favorites. I have, okay, technically I have 12 books, but um, it's fine. It was gonna be 10, but then I read a book recently that I was like, oh, I need to add this to the list. And so, I don't know. And two of them are in the same series. So I kind of was like, well, technically it's like 10 plus an honorable mention. So, I don't know. Regardless, let's get into it. We're going to start with the two most obvious ones. And that is Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June and Legend Born by Tracy Dion. I think I've talked about these on my channel a lot lately. So I don't want to spend too much time on them because I have vlogs reading them that I will link down below. But Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June is a YA gay romance. We are following Jay and he lives in rural Washington. He has been the only gay kid in town for the past 18 years, has never met any other queer person in his entire life. And then his family ends up moving to Seattle, Washington during his senior year of high school. And he's so excited about it because it means that he finally gets to meet other queer teenagers. And he has had this gay agenda that he has wanted to fulfill his entire life. Some of the things are really simple, like, you know, holding hands with a guy, going on a date with a guy, um, even just talking to one, but then it goes to like, you know, having sex for the first time and, you know, making out and things like that. So. It's really cute. He moves to this new school. He ends up having this really funny meet cute with this guy named Albert on the very first day. And they end up really hitting it off and they kind of start this really cute romance. And then he ends up meeting this other guy at school named Max and Max is genderqueer. He goes by she, her and he, him pronouns. And they are both in the Queer Street Alliance and Jay ends up finding himself partnering up with Max to kind of help run homecoming. The only thing is that homecoming at his new school is on the same day as hoedown at his old school. And he promised his childhood best friend Lou that he would attend the hoedown. And so now he's stuck making a decision of which does he go to. And so, you know, he's exploring his sexuality. He's doing all these new things for the first time. He's making a lot of mistakes. It's a huge coming of age sex positive story that had me laughing out loud. I literally was like crying in tears. It was so funny at times. Like if you are in like a reading slump or you're not having a good day, I would highly, highly recommend you pick up this book because it will just make everything better. Like I cannot wait to see what Jason Dream puts out next because this book was just phenomenal and it's one that's going to stick by me forever. Like I can actually see myself rereading this book and that is not something I say lightly because I am not someone who does tend to reread books. It's just not my thing, but this book, I would. Then we have Legend Born by Tracy Dion and this is an urban fantasy which is based in Arthurian legend. So we are following Brie and her mum was just killed in a car accident. And Brie thinks that there's something kind of off about the car accident happened because the police officer that showed up kind of had this like glimmery gleam to them. And then Brie ends up attending this college acceleration program at UNC Chapel Hill in the summer. And on her first night there, she ends up seeing this creature that no one else can seem to see, except for the fact that there are these two other college students that tend to battle it. Suddenly Brie finds herself entangled with a secret society known as the Legend Born. And these are a group of people who are descendants from the Knights of the Round Table from Arthurian myth. And Brie's mother also went to this school and Brie begins to wonder if maybe this this magical society had something to do with her mother's death because Brie is beginning to realize that there is some hidden magic deep inside of her. There is a really cute romance that goes on in this. There is also a potential love triangle that happens um, with this one dude who I think is like one of my new favorite characters. He starts off as like this one character that you're like, ugh, I don't like him, like who is he? And then at some point you're like, oh my God, I love him. If you like morally gray sorcerers, you will love this book because I have recently learned that morally gray sorcerers are like, a thing that I adore. So uh, yes, there's also a lot of commentary on this on black social injustice and on racism because Brie is one of the only black kids on this campus and the way that she is treated kind of as a token black person or just racism wise is very much talked about in this book. And also Brie's grief is talked about heavily in this book because she has not really dealt with the grief and the trauma of losing her mother and she is not really ready to accept what happened. And so it's also her emotional journey with that as well. This was just such a phenomenal book. There were just so many different layers to it. And I think that there was so much potential for this book to get messy. 
and like just become convoluted with so much going on but it didn't like Tracy Dion did such an amazing job weaving everything together and that just makes it so phenomenal and I'm and I'm so excited for the sequel it just it was really great. And then we have Destiny's Embrace by Beverly Jenkins. This is a Western historical romance. So in this one, we follow Mariah and Logan. Mariah lives on the East Coast and she comes from a very abusive family. Her mother has taken advantage of her since she was a young child. And Mariah is a seamstress for her mother, but never sees a penny of all the work that she does. One day after one too many beatings, she decides that she has had enough and decides to leave her mother and take a job in the West as a maid. And she ends up being the maid for Logan Yates. And he is the head of Destiny Ranch. And he has no desire to marry ever. He doesn't even want a maid. He is, you know, bachelor to the max. But his mother Alanza hired Mariah because she was like, you need to get your stuff in order. Like this is just ridiculous. And so Mariah arrives and Logan is just like determined to do everything he can to get her to leave but then he finds himself kind of enraptured by her. And Mariah, having you know spent her entire life being browbeaten, has decided that she's no longer gonna take crap from anyone. And so she's constantly fighting back with Logan and like constantly putting him in his place. And I just, I loved the banter between the two of them and the sexual tension that arise was so amazing. I will admit some of the uh, more steamy scenes were a little bit unrealistic in this one, but I can overlook that considering how great everything else was. I was laughing out loud constantly and I really loved that, you know, this was my first Western historical that we actually got a lot of backstory as to like how the West was created in America because I really don't know much about American history. So I actually felt like I learned a lot from this book but it didn't feel like I was being lectured to. So it was really great in that aspect. So those are like my top three books that I have read so far this year. And then the rest are all just ones that I've really enjoyed and I want to talk to you about. So we have The Secret Bridesmaid by Katie Birchall. This is a adult rom-com, but I would actually call it more of like an adult chiclet because the romance really isn't that prominent in it. But this is set in London and we are following Sophie Breeze and she is a bridesmaid for hire. So basically she works very discreetly. Brides or mother of the brides or someone in the family will hire her and she will pose as a bridesmaid in the bridal party so that no one knows that she's actually a wedding planner slash bride assistant. So she assumes these different identities every single time and she always bends over backwards and does everything to make the bride's life easier. And one day she gets the opportunity of a lifetime to be a bridesmaid for hire for Lady Cordelia Swan. She is hired by Cordelia's mother, who is the Marchioness of Mead. The only problem is that Cordelia wants nothing to do with her. She's determined to make her life a living hell. And so the two girls are constantly butting heads as Sophie is trying to help her while Cordelia is like giving her these like awful, awful tasks to do. But it's about their friendship and about the two of them kind of growing on one another and how they end up actually helping each other grow as people because they both have huge weaknesses and traumas in their life that have led them to kind of be more self-conscious. And I really love their blossoming friendship. And then there's also a slight romance between Sophie and Cordelia's brother. And that was also really amazing. I just love this book because it was just very much feel good. It was just like a chiclet that felt like, you know, you know when you watch like a really good rom-com and it just makes you kind of happy that's what this book is. It's a rom-com with a very light romance in it. And I guess I just loved all the funny things that went on to do with all the different uh, weddings that Sophie went to. They were just priceless. And, you know, as someone who's worked in the hospitality industry for like four years, I could just relate a lot to some of the things that Sophie had to do. And so it was just a really fun read. Then we have Lauren Last by Carla Nicole. This is an adult queer vampire romance. Haruka is a pure blood vampire. He comes from the Japanese bloodline, but he ended up fleeing to London because of something that happened in his past. And he has been living there ever since. There are not very many pure blood vampires left in the world. And there is a whole hierarchy to do with the vampiric system in this place. And so as a pure blood vampire, as one of like the highborns, he has to like do these certain events. And one day it comes to be that there's a new pure blood vampire who has entered English society. And this vampire is Nico. And he comes from the Italian vampire bloodline. And so Haruka ends up going to him one day and asking him like, why aren't you fulfilling your duty? Like you're the other pure blood vampire in this place. We're expected to do these events together. Like why aren't you turning up to them? And Nico reveals that he just doesn't feel comfortable doing it. So Haruka offers to teach him how to, you know, come into his place in high vampiric society. And the two of them end up having a romance. Nico is a complete cinnamon roll. He's all sunshine and laughter. And like, he has a bit of a traumatic backstory to do with child abuse. Um, just a trigger warning. And then Haruka is very uh, cold blooded, very straight laced. He doesn't really let anyone in, but as he gets to know Nico, he becomes all warm and fuzzy to him and like shows his whole vulnerable side to Nico. And like, 
Oh, it's like the cutest romance in the entire world. I was like smiling the entire time. It is extremely slow burn between the two of them, but then when it stops being slow burn and they get together, oh my god, is it steamy. Like, it's very steamy. There's no blood play in this, but it's steamy as Royal Stoma, so I would highly recommend this if you're looking for one. It's also on KU. Then we have the book that ended up making this list longer, and that is Ivan, which is by Sophie Lark. This is a Bratva mafia romance set in St. Petersburg. So in this one, we follow Sloane, and she is basically a hit woman for hire, and she has just been given a job to take out a Bratva boss, and that is Ivan. But when she goes to go assassinate him, she ends up being caught by him instead, and he ends up taking her prisoner. I loved this. It was like go, go, go from the start. And what I really loved about it is the fact that Sloane is so kick-ass. Like she can fight for herself. She, even though when she becomes captive and he starts giving her more leniency, the second he gives her leniency, she's like, okay, peace, I'm gonna escape. Like she doesn't like just become complacent and be like, maybe I'll stay. Like, no, she's like, oh, I could stay, but that would just be dumb of me. So I'm gonna go. And she's just like, so much fun. Like, I loved how there was action constantly throughout this. Ivan is very brutal, but you know, as soon as he meets Sloane, he instantly forms this attraction to her and like falls for her so quickly. They, I will admit it's a bit insta-lovey, but I love that part of it. And this was just so much fun. It was my first mafia romance and it's still like the best one I've read so far. So if you're looking to start mafia romances, I would highly recommend this one, especially if you like it to have a lot more action and thrill to it because that is what really did it for me in this one. Then we have two books that I'm lumping together, and that is When He Was Wicked by Julia Quinn and It's In His Kiss by Julia Quinn. These are books six and seven of the Bridgerton series, and I adore them. I will admit you have to read them in order after book three, all the books become very intertwined and all the characters become very intertwined. So that is the only disclaimer that I have. And the reason why I did lump them together is because they can't really be read separately. So When He Was Wicked follows Francesca, who is a widow who ends up falling for her ex-husband's cousin. And her ex-husband's cousin, Michael, has always been in love with Francesca, but he is known as being a notorious rake and he's never wanted to overstep anything. And so, they have this very angsty relationship between the two of them because they have this immense attraction that they don't want to act upon. It also takes place um, not only in London, but also away in Scotland as well. And also because she's a widow, she does have a lot more freedom. And so she can be a little bit more sexually adventurous. I would say When He Was Wicked was when the Bridgerton series finally became a little bit more spicier. Julia Quinn isn't really known for like having like spicy historical romances, but I would say When He Was Wicked was probably like the most of them all. But I do want to warn you that it does deal heavily with uh, miscarriage, infertility, and uh, grief of a loved one. So do be aware of that going into it, but I adore this one and I love the angsty romance between the two of them. And then It's In His Kiss is Hyacinth's book, and she has a romance with Gareth St. Clair, who is the niece of Lady Danbury. And Lady Danbury is a very prominent figure throughout the entire Bridgerton series and is an utter hoot of an old lady. So what I really love about this one is that Hyacinth is the most unconventional English woman. She, you know, was raised properly, but she, you know, does all the wrong things. And so no man actually wants to marry her because she acts so improper all the time. And the thing is, is that Gareth St. Clair ends up needing help translating this Italian notebook. And so Hyacinth one day is like, well, I know Italian, I can translate it for you. And he's like, I want nothing to do with this woman. And she's like, well, then who else are you going to get to do it? And so he's like, okay, fine. And so there's actually a slight mystery that goes on throughout this one as well, which I think is why I really liked it is because it had a mystery subplot. That's something that I definitely do dig in my historical romances. So this one was also really great. And what I really loved about this one was that there was just so much banter between Hyacinth and Gareth Sinclair because Hyacinth likes to think that she's always the smartest person in the room and Gareth comes in and he's also like equally as smart. So they have like all this intellectual banter. So it's really great. Then we had The Parsing Playbook by Isaac Fitzsimons. This is a YA trans romance and I think this book should go into every single library, whether it is public or school, in the entire world because every young teen needs to read this book. We are following Spencer who is trans and he was heavily bullied at his old school. So his family ends up moving him to a brand new private school and Spencer is passing. So he doesn't actually tell anyone at his new school that he is trans. 
and he used to be part of the soccer team at his old school and now he finally has a chance to join the boys soccer team officially at his new school since he is passing. But his parents refuse to let him join it because they're afraid that once everyone finds out that he is trans that he will be bullied again. But Spencer ends up going against his parents' wishes and joining the soccer team and the team ends up absolutely adoring him except for one person who is Justice. And Justice seems to have it out for Spencer in the beginning until Justice then begins to warm up to Spencer and they kind of start to have this slightly flirtatious relationship. The only problem is that Justice comes from an extremely religious family. What I really loved about it was that there was so much commentary about what it is like to transition at such a young age and also how important it is to have such supportive people around you. Like Spencer is super lucky in the fact that his parents are there for him the entire time. There's a lot of talk in here about, you know, trans rights and how, you know, a lot of people, even in the queer community itself, don't understand what it is like to be trans and the difficulties that they do undergo, especially non-binary people. There's a lot of talk in this about gender neutral bathrooms as well. And so I just think that this book was just very informative while also being very lighthearted, while also having some hard hitting moments. It was just, it was just like an overall amazing book. And I really don't think that there's anything else like it out there when it comes to trans contemporaries because it really did not focus on the romance. Then we have Second First Impressions by Sally Thorne. This book, oh, I loved it. Sally Thorne is back with a bang. So this one we're following Ruthie and she has a bit of a troubled past and as a result now has a lot of anxiety and OCD and she works at this luxury retirement village and she's very happy with how her life is going. It's all very orderly and she likes that, you know, her day is as it is. However, this property developer ends up buying the retirement village and it ends up putting everyone in jeopardy of the retirement village being demolished within a year's time. And when the property developer turns up, he ends up assigning his youngest son, Teddy, to live there for the summer. And Teddy and Ruthie ended up meeting a few days prior to this, where Teddy ended up uh, saying that the way that Ruthie was dressed looked like an old lady. And so she was immediately offended by Teddy and wanted nothing to do with him. She just thought that he was like this very aloof guy who took nothing seriously and was just rude. So when he turns up as a property developer's son, she decides she's gonna find some ways to make his life a living hell and ends up making him the personal assistant to these two old ladies who live there, who are notoriously known for like not having an assistant last for more than a week. And it is just really hilarious because you see how Ruthie and Teddy kind of complement one another and how he helps her come out of her shell while she also helps him kind of find some stability in life. And I just really related to like a lot of the things that Ruthie was going through in this book, just, you know, the fear of trying new things when everything kind of seems comfortable and kind of getting into a routine in your life and not really knowing how to break out of that. And the two old ladies just really made this book. It was just hilarious. And you know, there are just some other side characters in this book that I could totally see having their own book. And it was just a really great, you know, adult rom-com that I would highly recommend. Then for number 10 slash 11, depending on how you want to do with the Julia Quinn books, we have A Court of Silver Flames. I'm not going to go into this because I feel like most people do know about this book by now. I have an entire reading vlog focusing on it. This was an amazing book. I will say that it, it hasn't had as lasting an impression on me as like some of the other books that she has written before, but it still does stay with me. And it is still a book that I do think about from time to time. So I have to include on this list also because when I was reading it, it just had such a profound impact on me because of Nesta's journey throughout this story was just one that I could heavily relate to. And I also just love this world and I love seeing all the characters again. So it was just a really fun read. And then lastly for number 12 slash my honorable mention, but is just, just, just on this list anyway, cause I want to recommend it. We have Black Sunshine by Karina Halley. This is another vampire romance. So we're following Lenore Warwick and she ends up finding out that she is actually a vampire. And so on her 21st birthday, she's captured by this vampire mercenary who is very renowned and very powerful. He ends up keeping her prisoner because he is like, you are about to turn and transition into a vampire. And if you are left to your own devices, you will end up killing a lot of people. So I'm capturing you so that I can help you turn. And then I'm going to sell you to the highest bidder because you're going to be worth a lot of money. And so it is her romance with her captor. I would say that it was like after the 50% mark that I just found myself completely enamored with this book. Like the beginning was a bit slow going and had a bit of bit too many pop culture references, but then the second half, the vampire stuff all coming out and then like the romance getting hot and heavy, like, this had some of the best steamy scenes I have read in a while. Like I really loved them and the blood play and like the domineering part of it was just so 
good. I really enjoyed this book. It was just like, if you're looking for a sexy vampire romance, please pick this up. Some people call it dark. I don't think it's that dark of a paranormal romance, but it is on the darker side compared to like regular paranormal. So it just depends on who you are as a reader. So out of all the books I've read during the first six months of 2021, these are the 12 that I would recommend you to read. These are some of my favorites that I have read. Please let me know down below what one of your favorite books that you have read so far this year is and maybe I will check it out. If you did enjoy this video, please hit the like button down below. If you want to see more of me, please go to my channel and until next time, thanks a bunch everyone. Bye bye.